So I now want to teach you about something called racemic mixtures. Now, as we saw earlier with meso compounds, if I have a molecule that has a line of symmetry, that is, a straight line I can draw down the middle of that molecule anywhere and have everything on the left side look like the mirror image of everything to the right side, then that is a molecule that in itself will not rotate plane polarized light. That is, it's a molecule that's achiral. Similarly, if I happen to have a 50-50 mixture of two enantiomers, that mixture would also be achiral. Such mixtures are called racemic mixtures. As mentioned, racemic mixtures are achiral. That is, they don't rotate plane polarized light. Why? Well, because if I have a bottle that contains a totally 50-50 mixture of one enantiomer and the other enantiomer, we can imagine one enantiomer rotating plane polarized light by a certain amount and then the opposite enantiomer rotating it back by the same amount in the opposite direction. Thus, any rotation that they impose upon the plane polarized light cancels each other out. In contrast, if you happen to have a mixture that has a larger amount of one enantiomer than another, we call it an enantio-enriched mixture. Will that type of mixture rotate plane polarized light? Absolutely. We now move on to a different subject predicting the stereochemical outcomes of reactions in general. Now this is a principle I want you to remember. If I run any reaction and all of my reactants and reagents that I use in that reaction are all achiral, then I will, in general, always get achiral products out the other side. Here's an example. If I take cyclohexene and treat it with bromine, You'll note from what we discussed in an earlier chapter that the two bromines always end up being trans to each other. However, I could draw two different molecules that fit that description, the molecule to the left and the molecule to the right. You'll note that these two molecules are indeed enantiomers of each other. What I'm telling you is this. If I ran this reaction using reactants and reagents that are all achiral, I would get a completely 50-50 mixture or racemic mixture of both enantiomers as my products. Are my reactants and reagents achiral? Of course they are. Cyclohexene does not have any stereochemistry in it. Bromine doesn't have any stereochemistry in it. And this solvent, carbon tetrachloride, doesn't have any stereochemistry in it. Thus, if I ran this reaction, I would get a completely 50-50 mixture of both enantiomers in solution. A racemic mixture, which is achiral. Does that make sense? If I throw all achiral reagents into a reaction, I will get all achiral products out the other side. We would often report our results by saying that we would have no enantiomeric excess. That is, no excess of one enantiomer relative to the other. Let's take a look at another example. Imagine that I took dimethyl cyclohexene and treated it with hydrogen and palladium on carbon. These are hydrogenation conditions. As we learned in an earlier chapter, these conditions always place the hydrogens on the same side, giving me a cis dimethyl cyclohexane. Now, if we look at this molecule, you'll note that I could draw a line directly down the middle of it between these two methyl groups. And what would appear on the top of that line would be the mirror image of the stuff that appears to the bottom of that line. Thus, this molecule is a meso compound and is hence completely achiral. Note once again the principle. I threw achiral reagents and reactants into this pot and therefore will only form achiral products. Now, if you were to draw the other cis version of this molecule, that is, with both of these methyls attached to dashed bonds going down, You'll note that that molecule, if I flip it upside down like a pancake, is exactly the same as this molecule here, which has both of the methyls attached to wedged bonds coming up. Let's take a look at one more example. If I treat this one pentene with HBr, you'll note that I have no chiral reagents or reactants in the reaction. You'll remember from an earlier chapter that the alkene pi electrons come out and bond with the hydrogen. The hydrogen goes on the less substituted external carbon, leaving a temporary secondary carbocation in the middle. The bromide then comes in to form a bond there. 
But the question is, when the bromide comes in, three-dimensionally, does it come in from one side to form one enantiomer, or the other side to form the opposite enantiomer? The answer is both. And it will do so with absolutely no preference. Thus, I will get a 50-50 mixture of the bromide coming out three-dimensionally towards me and of the bromine going in three-dimensionally away from me. In other words, I will get a 50-50 racemic mixture, the one in which this Br is attached to a wedged bond coming out three-dimensionally towards us, and the one in which the Br is attached to a dashed bond pointing in three-dimensionally away from us. This is a completely racemic mixture. We often indicate a racemic mixture by drawing this. It's called a wavy bond. The wavy bond indicates that I have a completely 50-50 mixture of both enantiomers present. We would often report this by saying that there is no enantiomeric excess. With this as background, I want to throw a lecture question at you. What products will each of the following reactions make? Will the products obtained be racemic mixtures or not? So I have this alkene, one pentene, and I'm treating it with HCl. As we've noted from our earlier chapter, the product that I would form would begin to be assembled by having these pi electrons come out and form a bond with the hydrogen, which would bond with the less substituted external carbon, giving me a temporary secondary carbocation at this position. The chloride would then come in and form a bond with that internal carbon, giving me this product. Now you should note, now that we've learned about stereochemistry, that this carbon right here is a stereocenter. Thus, to express this molecule's shape in a completely correct fashion, we would have to indicate whether or not the bonds going to the chlorine and the hydrogen are pointing up or down three-dimensionally. Now you'll note that in this reaction, I have a completely achiral starting material and a completely achiral reactant interacting with each other. Thus, I should get a completely racemic mixture at this stereocenter. In other words, I'm going to get a 50-50 mixture of these two stereoisomers, which are indeed enantiomers. Now, just so you guys know, rather than drawing both enantiomers separately, one thing that I can do is draw a wavy bond going to the chlorine. That indicates that I have both enantiomers, the wedged and the dashed, at this position. Alternatively, if I wanted to, I could just draw one enantiomer in my answer and write the words plus enantiomer or plus the other enantiomer next to it to indicate that both enantiomers are present. Here's another problem. I have this cyclopentene here being treated with catalytic acid and methanol. As we've noted from an earlier chapter, electrons come out and place a hydrogen at the less substituted carbon up at the top, leaving me the tertiary carbocation in the middle. The oxygen then comes in with its lone pairs and forms a bond at that carbon, and the proton attached to that oxygen is removed to ultimately give me this molecule, which is an ether. You'll note that this position right here is a stereocenter. Thus, we could imagine forming both molecules with this bond to the oxygen being dashed and the other one with it being wedged. Which one forms? Well, because I've only set up this reaction having a chiral starting material and a chiral reactants, I'm going to get both enantiomers in a 50-50 mixture, as drawn here. As I mentioned in our previous example, we can redraw these in this manner, having a wavy bond going to the oxygen, which indicates in a simplified way that I have both enantiomers present. Here are some other examples that I will let you attempt to do on your own. This brings us to our second to last topic, the stereochemistry of hydroboration oxidation. By way of reminder from an earlier chapter's discussion, if we treat an alkene with water and catalytic acid, the acid protonates the less substituted carbon, giving me the more stable carbocation intermediate. The water eventually forms a bond with that carbocation and then gets deprotonated to form this type of product, where the OH is at the more substituted position. Now, as I asked in our earlier chapter, what if I don't want my OH there? Am I helpless? Is there anything I can do to put the OH at the other position? Yes, there is. If I treat the same molecule under these conditions, step one, borane or BH3, usually done with THF, and step two, peroxide, hydroxide, and water, 
it will actually place the OH on the less substituted carbon, giving me what we call the anti-Markovnikov product. These conditions are called hydroboration oxidation conditions. Now that we've learned about stereochemistry, we might wonder what stereochemical outcome occurs when we do a hydroboration oxidation. As it turns out, if I take my alkene and treat it with my BH3THF, what ends up occurring is the borane coordinates with this double bond and ends up forming this type of intermediate. As I later introduce my peroxide, hydroxide, and water, I eventually replace the BH2 substituent with an OH. And the OH ends up being on the same side as the hydrogen. Thus, the OH and the hydrogen added are cis to each other. In a rotatable molecule, we often use the term sin to each other. So let's take a look at an example. Imagine that I have one ethyl cyclohexene and I treat it under hydroboration oxidation conditions. What will the final stereochemistry of my stereocenter be relative to the position of the OH? Well, as mentioned, the OH is going to add on the less substituted carbon, the one down here. And the OH and the hydrogen that are added to this double bond under hydroboration oxidation conditions always end up being cis to each other in the final product, as shown here. Now you can see and imagine that there are two possible products that I could form that fit that description. One has the OH and the H both going up, and the other has the OH and the H both going down. These two molecules are indeed enantiomers of each other and would form in a 50-50 racemic mixture. The reason, of course, is because I only added achiral reagents and reactants out here. Thus, I get completely achiral products, a 50-50 racemic mixture out the other side. Note, however, that under these reaction conditions, I can never get the OH and the ethyl group pointing in the same direction as each other. The reason is because hydroboration oxidation conditions always add the hydrogen and the hydroxyl group to the same side of the double bond. This brings us back to a topic that I introduced to you guys at the beginning of this chapter. But I once again want to reiterate. Most enzymes in all living things, including people, are chiral and therefore have the ability to discriminate between enantiomers. This makes it so that enzymes can convert racemic, meso, or achiral reactants into chiral products. For example, fumarase, which is an enzyme shown over the reaction arrow here, and is found in most eukaryotic organisms, catalyzes a reaction in living systems that converts this molecule, fumarate, into malate, the product shown here. Interestingly enough, fumarase, because it's chiral, can distinguish between the trans isomer of fumarate and the cis isomer of fumarate. And in fact, fumarase will not react with the cis isomer. Thus, any reaction between fumarase and the cis isomer of fumarate would give no product. But it will react with the trans isomer. Now, I realize that these two molecules do not have stereocenters in them. However, they are two different molecules that have the exact same chemical formulas as each other and the same bonding order. I have a COO minus stuck to a carbon that's double bonded to a carbon that's stuck to a COO minus in both of them. These two molecules are not enantiomers of each other, but they also aren't constitutional isomers of each other. What type of isomers are they? Well, they are indeed stereoisomers of each other and we throw them by default into the final stereoisomeric category. We also call these diastereomers. You might remember from an earlier discussion that I said if you have two different molecules that look otherwise exactly the same and each of them have two stereocenters or more in them and they aren't enantiomers and aren't the same molecule, that is they're somewhere in between R to S, then those are diastereomers. These types of molecules, cis-trans isomers of each other that are not enantiomers and are not the same, are also considered diastereomers. And this enzyme, fumarase, has the ability to completely distinguish between them and only react with one and not the other. So that brings us to the end of our Chapter 5 coverage of stereochemistry. Thanks for hanging in there and listening to this long and hopefully interesting discussion from the world of organic chemistry. Until next time, please have an enjoyable rest of your day.